Children, you are released for Children's Church, unless you want to stay. All right, so I usually forget that, but a funnier thing is, not really funny, I almost got fired before I was even hired. I forgot to mention uh, the offering in first service, so I could have been in a big, big trouble on that one. So what we're going to do today is, after the sermon, folks, uh, we're going to have uh, communion, and then immediately following communion, give us your money, okay? <laughs> and I actually had somebody say they went to a Baptist church uh, years ago, and the pastor, when he was preaching, and they passed the offering plate, if uh, there wasn't enough money in it, he would say, we're going to have to pass it again, and then they pass it around again. So we might have to do that one, I mean, if we really have to. So good morning. Um, please open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, because we're going to read the Bible today. You don't want to hear just what I have to say, I'm assuming. We want to hear from the Lord. So Matthew chapter 7, uh, the title today is, Who Are You to Judge? And that could be taken two ways. I'm sure people driving by on Kipling saw our sign, and they're thinking either, who are you to judge, or who are we supposed to be judging? <laughs> so I thought that that would uh, maybe cast a bigger net. Uh, judging by the attendance, maybe people were a, real, a little uh, repelled. <laughs> maybe it didn't go so well. And the best idea. All right, anyhow, uh, open your Bibles to Matthew 7. Let's start in verse 1. I want to read this, and then we'll, then we'll move on, okay? Verse 1, this is our Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye, when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. Oh, Lord, <laughs> we can end it right there. Again, with your words, Lord Jesus, uh, how you pierce our hearts. Lord, it seems like every time I read this passage, um, I have the tendency to be very convicted. Um, so, Lord, I, I'm, I'm asking you today that you would convict where you want to convict, but we're also asking that you would give freedom where you would like to give freedom today. Uh, as we look to your word, you said that uh, uh, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And we are in your presence, and we know your Spirit is here. You are all around us. And we ask, Holy Spirit, that you would indeed stir our hearts and minds and speak to us. May we be changed forever. We don't say that generically, but Lord, may we be changed forever by what you have to say to us today. Lord, instruct us on judgment. Instruct us um, on discernment and the differences between the two and how we are to live in your kingdom, ministering to the world around us. Lord, I pray that we would be mature, that we would uh, be bold in our faith, uh, and that we would accurately represent you, our God, our King, our Lord, our Savior, uh, in this community and throughout the ends of the earth. God, I, I want to see you move. And we know more than me wanting it, more than us wanting it, Lord, we, want, we know that you want us to grow up and to, to mature. So we thank you for this time. This is indeed your time, and we ask that Above all things, that you would have your way, that your will would be done, and that your word would be on display for us today. So we thank you in advance. We pray in faith in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So I wanted to try my, uh, my first service humor, I used to call it, um, <laughs> my pastoral humor. Uh, who can tell me where in the Bible baseball is first mentioned? What? In the beginning. In the beginning. Yeah, Genesis 1-1. Very good. In the beginning. No applause. Okay. Uh, this, is, this is my, this is my, this is my, my daughter's. This is a good one. When was Adam created? Oh! 
just before Eve. Very good. Oh, okay. Yeah, I know. I need somebody up here. Yeah, the gong. Time's up. Yeah, what's that show with the X's? You know, I would have got X'd like three times on two jokes. So, uh, what we're talking about today is not my poor humor. What we're talking about is essentially, I saw a bumper sticker not too long ago. Um, a person came flying by me in traffic, driving like an absolute maniac. And the bumper sticker said, uh, Be nice. You never know what somebody else is going through. And that was really good because you're just about to lay on the horn and you're like, What does that say? <laughs> yeah, that's really good. And it's very true. The other thing that was true is that, you know, I was, you know, Ben, as some of you know, you know, we've gone through a little tumultuous time with losing my dad to cancer and stuff, and so all this happened at one time, and I'm preparing for this message on judging other people, when all of a sudden I find myself being very, very acutely aware of just how much judging I actually do. We all do it. I had some person very recently come up to me and say, hey, I'm very sorry, because the first time I saw you get up to preach, my thoughts were, and how did they put it? Oh my God, what is happening now? And she said, <laughs> she said I judged you on your appearance. And uh, she said, after you know, I heard you speak, things went well, and you know, the Lord really did a work in her heart, uh, But when you're going throughout life, especially when you're standing in front of people actually speaking, that's just the natural reaction. That's just what you do. You go to a new church, what do you do? You judge the pastor. That's, that's what you do. You judge the music, and then when they get up and give a sermon or whatever, then you're, you're judging them. You're, you're paying attention to them, and it's normal. It's natural, right? But what we're looking at today is the very nature of passing judgment on somebody and the differences, biblically speaking, of what it is to pass judgment on somebody and to actually be discerning. Very big differences. Okay, so we're going to look at that a little bit, the nature of, of things, but also as it pertains to ourselves. How many of you know that if we are very self-aware, you naturally become self-conscious? It's just the way it is. If you're paying attention to self, all of a sudden you're paying attention to self, and everything starts reflecting against self, and ourselves become the litmus test for the world that we experience around us. And that's a scary place to be. So we're going to unpack a little bit of this, biblically speaking, and then we're going to apply it to our intimacy with our king. So first things first, as Jesus always did, is that he would weigh things in the spiritual realm right? He always spoke to the Spirit. He's saying, you guys are seeing it this way, but I'm seeing it completely different, right? For instance, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. That, I don't know, what we know about human psychology is that our number one instinct is self-preservation. If a fire is burning me, I get away from it. If I'm in water and I can't swim, I try to get out of it, right? So it's, it's self-preservation, but the kingdom of God is totally opposite in many, many ways. And we're going to look at that because without looking at today's uh, passages through the lens of the kingdom of God, it becomes very difficult to actually grasp the power and the gravity of what we're actually reading, right? There's no change that's going to come from anything if we don't look at it through the lens that God sees it in, okay? I guess just like everything else, right? So... This is the problem. The kingdom of the world around us, so we have the two kingdoms, the kingdom of the world and we have the kingdom of God. We have the kingdom of the world that this is what is tangible. This is what we see. This is what we judge. You ever walk into a room and, uh, or get on a bus or something and everybody's looking at you and they do this one? And you're like, well, I've been judged. <laughs> I wonder what they're thinking, right? Right? I mean, it's just naturally. You go into this restaurant wearing this coat, and all of a sudden everybody goes, boom. I've assessed you. They've assessed your financial situation, your clothing choice, your lack maybe of style, 
you know, you get judged everywhere you go, and it's natural. And if we say we don't judge, well, this is, this is one that came to me. When you go to a place and you say, man, those people were so judgmental. <laughs> Wait a minute. I just got dumber. Did I just judge them for being judgmental? So it's almost worse. Like it might even be exponentially worse because I just judged them for something that they may or may not be, but I did pass judgment upon them, right? Like our judgment runs deep. You know, if that's what we want to be known for, I think naturally we all kind of got it going on. But the problem is, is like I said, that we're living in the natural world and we see the tangible, we see the physical, right? Very, very uh, difficult to navigate through this world without being judgmental, but yet we're still called to be who God has called us to be. We're not called to be sheep or fools and just be blown about by every wave of, of doctrine or uh, societal norms. We're supposed to be paying attention, but Christ Jesus here says, do not judge. So what are we supposed to be doing? There is actually very... Uh, some very clear scriptural passages that elaborate on this and we get context on all of it through the kingdom. So this is what the kingdom of the world says. As it, I'm sure a lot of you guys know, as you study your Bible, let's say you're studying the Hebrew or the Greek of some word, you could spend weeks coming up uh, with some sort of definition and then to actually uh, boil it down and boil it down, uh, it's kind of a difficult task. But based on what Scripture says about the world around us and what we experience, secondarily to what the Bible says, this, this is what the kingdom of the world is saying about you. You are the most important being that exists. Sound familiar? The universe exists to serve you. You are more important than anyone or anything else. Put yourself first. Like when you're in the airplane, first put the mask on yourself, then you can help somebody else. Kind of similar. It's all about you. If there is a God or gods, he or they exist to serve you and make you happy. So make sure to put yourself, your interests, and your will first. You are in charge. Do things your way. You are the judge. It's only natural. When we are the center, when we are the focal point, it is absolutely natural that we become the judge. Right? As they say, what's the phrase? He wanted to play judge, jury, and executioner. Well, that's who we become in the flesh. In the world around us, that's what we are. So, of course, we're going to be judged. You're going to be judged. I'm going to be judged. Because we are the focus. Now listen to this. This uh, messianic Rabbi Lauren Jacobs, I really like the way he writes. He boils down a lot of scripture in a way that I can understand it. But he gives a marvelous comparison between the kingdom of the world and the focal point of the kingdom of God. This is, this is great. He, he basically compiles lots of scripture and puts it into a vernacular that I can understand. This is the focus of the kingdom of God now. God is supremely important. God is. Your reason for being to, uh, is to exist for God, to love Him, to serve Him, to worship this glorious being that gave you life. In everything you do, glorify God. Everything that you do, you say, and you think it should reflect well upon Him and bring Him honor. A little different. He says, demonstrate that he is the supreme being who is rightfully in control of every aspect of your life. Don't ignore God. You exist to do his will, to bring him honor and glory by being a godly and righteous human being. You are important, but God is the most important. And other human beings are also important and must be treated properly. Sounds a little different. This is where it gets really heavy. This is, this is heavy stuff. Apart from what we do with God, for God, connected to God, all that we do will be vain, useless, meaningless, empty, without eternal significance. Whew. Have you ever felt this? Maybe you have your sights set on a new car. 
or a new house, or maybe the perfect man or woman to marry, or maybe a fishing trip that if I just got this fishing trip in, if I was able to go you know, down to the Caribbean and fly fish for tarpon, then, then I would have fulfillment in my life. And then all of a sudden, you get what you were longing for, and you are overwhelmed by a feeling and thought of utter emptiness. I got it and there's nothing there. It's like sand right through my hands. There's nothing there. So then what do we do? We find a new thing. Now I'm going to go here. I'm going to go there. I need this promotion at work. And then when I have that, then I'll have fulfillment. Or I need to be as altruistic as I possibly can. This is a natural conclusion. When you've had enough stuff, all of a sudden you say, when I start giving myself a little bit more, when I start using my talents to make the world a better place, then, surely then, I will have fulfillment. All of a sudden you're opening, you know, uh, restaurants that, that are serving people pro bono and you're taking care of so many people and you're doing all the stuff and there is still emptiness. And you say, then what? Right? Boy, that's a terrible, terrible cycle. And it's only natural in the world. It only makes sense. Okay, but thank God there's an answer for this. Instead of constantly searching for more and more, we start looking for a person, and his name is Jesus Christ. And then life becomes absolutely fantastic. Okay? We're going to talk a little bit about that. But as we look at the focus of the kingdom of God, the focus, it was very clear. I love how he put this, that it is God who is supremely important. The focus is on the almighty God. He is king. He is wonderful. He is nice, and he gave you taste buds. Right? We just had wings the other day. You know, and we're like, God, thank you for my taste buds. He is good. And the focus of the kingdom of God is him. Therefore, he is the judge. He is the judge. As Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 3, uh, starting in verse 10, But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to the light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. It will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved even though only as one escaping through the flames. He's speaking of Christians here and what really matters, what is empty, right? How many of you have ever experienced this? When, um, have you ever like, worked in a soup kitchen or a food kitchen or helped the homeless in any way? And you always have this feeling of like, I'm going to go and I'm going to bless somebody. I'm just going to go and serve and I want to minister and I want to listen and I just want, I want to get dirty. I want to get in the trenches. I want to do this thing. And you go there and you leave there having all those people minister to you, Amen. right? Yeah. And you're like, wow, thank you, God. He ministers to us. So there is such a value in the kingdom of God and in pouring into people in the kingdom of God in a way that that lasts forever. You will never lose that. Like we always say, you will never regret sacrificing for the kingdom. You will never regret sacrificing for your family and your friends and your neighbors in whatever capacity. There is no regret there. That's actually called eternal value, right? Big difference, big contrast from the kingdom of the world around us. So this, this does, this speaks of testing. I wanted to emphasize that because that's one of the greatest themes that we're talking about today. Like I said, we're not supposed to be ignorant and foolish and just swallow any pill that the world has for us. You know, we're going to get blue-pilled or whatever it is in the matrix. The blue pill is the ig pill of ignorance, right? But the red pill is your eyes are going to be open, right? God is saying, open your eyes. But there's a specific way to do it. We know that the church, one of the greatest um, accusations the kingdom of the world has against the church is the H word. You are all hypocrites, right? And these people are judgmental. 
they judge me every time I come around or every time my aunt comes around, all of a sudden she's judging me, judging my lifestyle, judging this, judging that, okay? So that is, a, a, um, the world has that bone to pick with the church, but we're going to clarify these things because there is a level of discernment that we are responsible for. We have to speak up for what is right. We have to. We don't have a choice. Okay? That's why Galatians 6, uh, verse 8 through 10, listen to this. Speaking of testing and authenticity, whoever sows to please their flesh from the flesh will reap destruction. It's not pure. The motive of sowing is not pure there. But whoever sows to please the Spirit from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. There is this theme again of testing, of purity, of why are you doing it? Do you want people to give you that attaboy, girl, good job? You know, you are really doing it. Or is it like, I don't even care what you have to say. I'm going there and it doesn't matter. I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing. I don't care what you think, right? Because I'm doing it for him. So as we go, God is calling his people Christians. This is the focus. This is totally different than, you know, speaking of the world. We're speaking about the kingdom of God. He is calling us to live in the realities of his kingdom, right? As we've already distinguished, his kingdom has different rules. Uh, Everything is different. But if we are called to, uh, as Christ Jesus said, as you go, raise the sick, heal, uh, raise the dead, heal the sick, cleanse lepers, cast out demons, freely have you, you have received, freely give. Okay, how in the heck are we supposed to do that if we're not living in the kingdom? He gives us a completely impossible mandate of the kingdom. We cannot do unless we are operating under the rules of the kingdom. Judging others is one of those uh, rules or principles that is covered. As Jesus said, I confer upon you a kingdom, just as my Father has confirmed the kingdom on me. That was in Luke 22. I confer upon you a kingdom. Do you know what confer means? This is a really fun word in English. Being conferred something is, let's say you you work very, very hard. Um, Let's say you dropped out of high school and you worked very hard and you went and you got your GED. You did the thing. You completed it. Okay? It wasn't easy, but you did it. They confer upon you your GED. Okay? They say, you have earned it. Good job. Now you get your GED. You work really hard on your PhD. You study. You do this. You do that. You jump through all the hoops that seem absolutely arbitrary. And uh, what am I doing this for? It's like geometry to me. (laughs) I'm doing all these things. I did the work. I'm doing the work. All of a sudden, somebody comes to you and hands you this piece of paper, and they say, I confer upon you your PhD. Okay? It's all the work that you put into something, all of a sudden it is conferred upon you. Jesus said, I confer upon you a kingdom. Except you didn't work for it. I worked for it. Now I'm giving it to you so that you can live in it. Isn't that amazing? This is almost too good to be true. We always say that. This is too good to be true, but it's not. We're to operate here and judging others is very, very central because look at this. It has the power to repel people in a way that nothing else can. Just like, uh, have you noticed this? That as you minister, generosity has a way to pull people in in a way that very little else can. Have you ever noticed that? Giving of yourself, giving of your time, giving of your resources, it has this ability to open people's hands. My mom used to teach me this. When you go around cursing people and having a bad attitude and this and that, you're closing people's hands. But when you're blessing people, you open their hands, therefore you can place stuff in. Okay? So in the kingdom of God, we're called to open people's hands so that they can receive the kingdom from us. Okay? Judging people er, closes their hand and they ain't going to let you back in. Okay? It's an amazing principle. 
So will somebody do me a favor and open their Bible to John chapter 3? You might have read that before. But John chapter 3, I'm going to ask you to read John uh, chapter 3. Let's do like 16 through verse 20 momentarily. So if somebody wants to volunteer, go ahead and get your finger. Nice. Okay. In just a second. Okay. So with sober assessment, we need to ask ourselves, what kingdom are we living from? So we've, we've determined the two kingdoms. We have the kingdom of the world and we have the kingdom of God. Which are we living from? Sometimes it varies from traffic light to traffic light, right? I'm feeling pretty good. Ah! And all of a sudden, I'm in the kingdom of the world. I'm in the flesh and now I'm back in the spirit, right? So it's, sometimes it's back and forth. Sometimes you get out of a conversation and you say, man, that was just filled with the kingdom of God. That was the kingdom right there. Maybe you're, you're ministering to a waitress that's serving you or something, and you're like, wow, the kingdom of God was there. As Jesus said, my kingdom is within you or among you. And then all of a sudden, you have a conversation with your boss, and you're living straight in the kingdom of the world. And we have the choice. Which kingdom are we going to live in? One of these kingdoms completely opposes this passage. One kingdom completely facilitates this passage in a very beautiful way. So that's what we're going to move to. Let's look at our text really briefly, and then we're going to jump to John chapter 3. So Matthew chapter 7, verse 1. Let's read this again. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. Oof. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Let's stop there. Do not judge. Very clear language there. Uh, you can't really twist that scripture. Jesus says, do not judge. That is actually, kind of obviously, a judicial term for judging. When we look at the definition of it and we boil it down, we take the pages and pages and pages of the study of the Greek of this word to judge, we can boil it down to this. It's basically this, to judge, to be summoned to a trial so that one's case may be examined and judgment passed upon it. When we judge, it's saying, come on into my courtroom. I'm the judge. I'm the authority. Come into my courtroom. I'm going to weigh your appearance. I'm going to weigh your social status. I'm going to weigh your financial status. And I'm going to pass a judgment upon you. That's what Jesus is saying. That's what happens. And not only that, as we move on just a little bit, there is this amazing pattern that Jesus, he, he clips us on. Okay? He says, do not judge. Then, with the same measure you use, it will be measured to you. That almost seems a little out of place. But what he's saying is not only are you, we, guilty of judging somebody. Come on in. Let me judge you and boil your life down to, to this. I'll reduce you here. I'm going to reduce you, judge you, and then, in measuring out to you, I'm going to give you the punishment you deserve. That's really heavy stuff. Come on in. I judge you. This is what you deserve. This is your punishment. And Jesus is saying, don't do that. That's not what we're called to do. So if, Miss Sandy, would you be willing to read that? John 3, 16 through 20. Hmm. You ever heard that before? Pretty heavy. But have you noticed the word condemn in there? That Jesus did not come into the world to condemn the world, but God sent his son to save the world through him. He came to seek and save 
that which, which was lost. As Jesus said, it's not the healthy people that need the doctor, but the sick. He came to save. So if Jesus does not do the condemnation, who are we to condemn the world? You want to know an interesting part? When we're looking at this judicial term for judge, come on into my courtroom, I'm going to judge you, I'm going to evaluate you, it comes from the exact same root as condemn. We're condemning the world. When we're judging the world, we are condemning the world. We are stepping out of our boundaries. We are stepping into an authority that we have not been given. If Christ Jesus said, I didn't even come to condemn the world, who are we? Who are we to judge? It is very, very intense. Some people get this confused in the church. And these are our brothers and sisters. And I do love them. And we are all called to mature. There are ways that we all have things not quite right. But there are uh, legs of the body of Christ that get the time frame a little confused as far as this. Uh, in the, on the last day, Christ Jesus comes to judge. There is a judgment day. What happens is the church gets the last day confused with the last days. <laughs> the last days... Christ Jesus is reconciling the world to himself. On the last day comes condemnation for those who are condemned already. Right? He does not condemn the world. They stand condemned already because they rejected God's one and only son, the sacrificial lamb, to die, who came to die and give us salvation. Okay? But we're putting the cart before the horse and we're going around saying, you're condemned, you're judged, you're condemned, you're judged rather than let's leave that to the king and we're going to come out here we're going to love the world and tell them the truth. Part of the truth is, factually, sin is sin. There is this problem. We've all experienced it, right? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is awful and it ruins everything. When we look at our Bibles and we look at the, what is it, the first two pages... There is sinlessness. And there is actually only one sentence that emphatically, or no, explicitly uh, explains what the world was like. Adam and Eve were naked and they were without shame. That's the only verse that explicitly describes what it is to be without sin. The rest of the Bible is about trying to get back to that sentence. Without shame, without condemnation. Isn't that interesting? It's a, it's a very interesting place that we are in now. So our job as the church is not to condemn, it's not to judge, but it's to do something else. We're not supposed to be fools. We're not supposed to be sheep. We're not supposed to swallow any pill like we've said and accept what the world around us says. We have to call things for what they are. So how we do that, how do we do that without being judgy? As my wife and I say, I felt like I was being a little judgy there. I'm sorry. Did I, did, I, did I hurt your feelings? Did I come across too judgy? You know? Yeah, you did, hon. You know? So sorry, hon. But uh, sometimes I could come across a little judgy. I think we all can. All right? But how in the heck are we supposed to come across then? Right? If we're supposed to call sin, sin, we're supposed to call evil, evil, well, how do we do it without being judgy? Because... For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged. So are we going to live by a double standard? Ever been accused of that? I haven't either. <laughs> I've, never, I've never had a double standard ever in my life. And with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. Again, that's that, that's that pattern that Jesus exposes. I judge you, and not only that, I tell you what you deserve uh, consequently. Right? Don't do that. Let's move on to verse 3. Why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there is a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. Don't you just love Jesus' catchphrases? <laughs> that was one of them. You hypocrite. First, take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. It's asinine. As I tell the kids all the time, you got the plank going on. They know exactly what we're talking about. And then all of a sudden when I'm talking to my kids about their plank, I'm like, oh my gosh. 
I think I have a plank in my eye. <laughs> and they have busted me on that several times, and I am very thankful for these kids being able to call their daddy on shenanigans. You hypocrite. Matthew Henry puts it this way. I, I really like this. It is as strange, as strange, that a man or a woman can be in a sinful, miserable condition and not be aware of it, as that of a man should have a plank in his eye and not consider it. Here's a good rule for the reprovers. First, reform yourself. Evaluate yourself. Test yourself. It's way too easy to evaluate everybody else instead of evaluate ourself. So here's, here's a problem, though. We alluded to it earlier. Jesus says in this passage, do not judge. Elsewhere in James chapter 4, Romans chapter 2, Luke 6, we know about Romans chapter 2, I hope. Over and over again, the Bible is very emphatic about do not judge, do not judge, do not judge, do not judge, but yet we have portions of the Bible that say completely the opposite. How do we reconcile this? Here's a few verses. 2 Corinthians 2.15 The spiritual person judges all things, but is himself to be judged by no one. So I'm going to go around and judge all things, but you can't judge me. <laughs> That's what it sounds like it's saying, right? That seems a little... <clears throat> Judgy. Very good. 1 Corinthians 5. Here's another one. Verse 12 through 13. For what have I to do with judging outsiders? It is, not those, is it not those inside the church you are to judge? God judges those outside. So you're telling me I am to judge now, Paul. Well, Jesus said not to judge. To clarify this a little bit, this, this has actually already been answered by Miss Sandy's passage there in John chapter 3. Judging people on the outside is like this. You find somebody who has been unfaithful to their spouse, and they do not know Christ Jesus. And you say, the Bible says you are not supposed to do that. And they look at you and be like, the what? Like Harry Potter said not to do that? Like, what fictitious book are you talking about? Because I don't believe in the Bible. In other words, we're holding the, word, the world to a standard that we can't even hold up. Only God in us can uphold that standard, right? So we're trying to say, you need to jump through all these hoops, and I'm going to judge you for not jumping through these hoops, when they don't have any power source to jump through any hoops. They don't even know what the hoops are. It's amazing. So we're going to hold everybody to a standard that they're like, okay, judgy guy. And then they move on. And then we find we're kind of struggling upholding these standards because we're living in the wrong kingdom. So it's a very slippery slope, very dangerous ground for judging, as Jesus said, because you're going to be judged by the same standard. With the same measure you use, it's going to be measured to you. So what choice do you have? How about we'll try a different angle? Let's try a different approach. Let's try... Not condemning, not judging, but let's do something else. Let's look at a couple clarifying pictures that, that clarify this apparent contradiction, okay? 1 John 4.1, one of my favorites. Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. Test the spirits. Testing the spirits. As Jesus said, mm, I think it is in Matthew 8, where he said, on those last days, somebody's going to come up to me and say, Lord, Lord, didn't, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not do miraculous signs in your name? And Jesus says, and I will say to them, away from me, I never knew you. They were not doing it out of the kingdom of God. They were doing it in some other kingdom, but it wasn't of the kingdom of God. And isn't that scary ground? Because it's like, well, I don't really prophesy that much, and I don't really perform very many miracles or signs and wonders. What he's saying here is, therefore, test yourself to see where you are. What's the spirit behind what you're doing? Are you doing it 
for the kingdom, in the kingdom, by the power of the kingdom, or are you doing it for whoever knows what, whatever reasons? Usually it has to do with self. Philippians 1, 9 through 10. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Look at the correlation between love and discernment. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Uh, anybody watch the Miss America pageants? I got to admit, when I was younger, I didn't mind watching them. Um, but now they're a little boring. To me, I, I just, it's not really my thing. It just gets a little boring. But let me ask you this question. When they look at the contestants in the pageant, are they looking for which one has fewer flaws in their physical features? Are they looking for the one that has fewer flaws in her ability to articulate her political stance? Are they looking for fewer flaws in the way she walks or anything like that? No. What they're looking for in Miss America is who has the goods. It's not looking for a lack of negative. It's looking for an abundance of the positive. There's a big distinction there. That's exactly what this passage is saying. Let me, let me read it again. I don't know if that stuck. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. There is a discernment to approve what is excellent. We are able to say, this is good. As I was talking with my daughter Abigail on the way here, we were talking about essentially the word of God, Jesus himself. He is the litmus test for life. Everything gets weighed on him. He said, everything you have seen me do, I'm only doing what my father has already done. Everything I say, that's what he has already said. He was the witness, the example for who God is. Everything we do and see must be weighed on the person of Jesus Christ. Then we know what is good, what is right, Noble, admirable, excellent, lovely, praiseworthy, right? So he is the standard. So instead of judging, you're missing the standard, we're saying, well, what is the standard? And am I living up to this standard? It is possible to say, this person is not living in a holy way. It's a different thing to judge them and say, because you're not living in the holy way, your sentence is this. Do you see the difference? It is very important. Hebrews 5.14, one of my favorites. But solid food is for the mature. It is for those who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. A mature Christian constantly is discerning the world around them and saying, this is good, this is evil, and now I have a choice to make. Constant use. Notice it did not emphasize that if you have the spiritual gift of discernment, then you are to constantly use that gift. This is for all Christians to constantly be discerning good from evil. Right? And rejecting evil, in other words, not participating in it, but doing what is good. What is is that verse... Maybe some of you have it. Any of you knows the good that you ought to do and yet does not do it? That to you is sin? Anybody know the reference? I don't know. It sounds right. Sounds Jamesy to me. Doesn't sound sound judgy. It sounds Jamesy. All right. All right. So this is the same thing in Hosea 14.9. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right. And the upright walk in them, but transgressors stumble in them. So do you see, this is not about judging other people. It's discerning right from wrong and then making a choice. I want to read that again. Because there is a verb, there is a consequence that we are called to. Whoever is wise, let him understand these things. Whoever is discerning, let him know them. For the ways of the Lord are right, but that's not enough and the upright walk in them. Do you see, church, 
It's not enough to say, I know the difference between judging and discerning, but then not do anything about it. We are called to walk in the truth, right? His people will worship him in spirit and in truth, not just talk about it and have a Bible study and get good at it, but let's walk it out, right? So, if the application then is how we live our lives, we know that we are not to judge, as Jesus says, and condemn and give the, um, the, the, the sentence, whatever it may be, the severity of it, but we are to discern what is right, what is wrong, what is good, what is evil, therefore to do it, let me ask you this, how come we still feel condemned sometimes? Sometimes we go about life feeling so condemned we, we become paralyzed, right? How many times have you, you, you've sinned, you've stepped out of the, the bounds of, of morality or something that you know you weren't supposed to say, you knew you weren't supposed to do it, and next thing you know, you say, I can't even pray right now. I, I just, I can't. Don't talk to me about God right now. I, you know, I'm going through some stuff. And then the next day happens, and then you sin again, maybe in the same way, and then you're really like, oh boy, now I really have a wall between me and God. He's really upset at me, and I cannot face God. I cannot, as the Bible says, come boldly and confidently to the throne of God. I need to sit back here because he's angry at me, and he is pushing me away. He has judged me and condemned me. But didn't John three sixteen through 20 just say that he did not condemn you? Well, why do we feel this way? Is it because God is in his, as uh, Dr. Andrew Farley puts it, he's not in his lazy boy chair, and uh, when you sin, he goes, I'm turning my back to you, and all of a sudden you're doing good. All right, I'm back. You know, does God have amnesia? Did you catch him off guard by something that you did or said? No. He said, I do not condemn you. Right? Remember the lady who was caught in adultery and all the guys were trying to stone her and they bring her before the Lord and he starts writing in the ground. You know, we could only uh, guess at what he was saying. But then he says, all right, how about this? You can stone her, but any of you who is without sin, you throw the first stone. And from the eldest to the youngest, they all walked away, dropped their stones, walked away. And he says, lady, where are your accusers now? Who's condemning you now? And she says, no one. And he said, well, then neither do I condemn you. (laughs) Neither do I judge you. Now go and stop sinning. That's Jesus. But the problem is, is we sit here and we get condemned. Even when we take communion, one of the most, I guess, poorly interpreted passages in Scripture we're actually going to go over today for communion, but it, it, it comes with it an air of judgment and condemnation to where you're trying to take communion, but you feel so bad about yourself, all of a sudden you are not worried about, about the Christ. You're not worried about the yes and amen. You're not worried about what he's done for you. You're worried about what he had to die for because I'm such a scumbag, because I did this again, because I yelled at my family, because I cheated on my taxes or whatever else it is. All of a sudden it's the guilt, the shame, the condemnation all over again. And let me tell you, that might not be a plan of the Lord that you feel that way. It might actually be a tool of someone who hates you. If he could get you hamstrung, focused on self, guilt, shame, condemnation, all of a sudden you ain't thinking about ministry. You're not thinking about loving your family. You're not thinking about going out and taking care of people. You're worried about what a loser you are and what a fail you are in the spirit. I've already lost it. I'm counted out. Best case scenario is I die and I go to heaven. That's the natural outcome. But that's not what God has for us. Look at this. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 11 as we transition into communion. I want to read this to you. This is where people tend to get uh, caught up. This, This really epitomizes that whole mindset. So bear with me, okay? There's a pattern here, and it happens to every single one of us. Verse 27. For this reason, whoever eats the bread and drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Ouch! A person should examine himself first, and in this way let him eat the bread and drink of the cup. 
For the one who eats and drinks without careful regard for the body eats and drinks judgment upon himself. It's usually at that point that you start feeling really bad about your sins and all the stuff. Have you ever been overwhelmed with the feeling, I hope there's more than one of us, of you blow it, you sin in some way, and you start to feel the guilt, the shame, the condemnation. And then you get this awful thought. It's only a matter of time till I do this again. <laughs> Am I the only one? Please tell me I'm not. I hate that feeling. I hate that thought of being like, God knows all those sins that I have yet to do. Like that feeling of, you know, when you step out of bounds and you put your foot in your mouth and you're like, oh, if I could go back five seconds, I would. You know, I would sell a lot of stuff to go back in time and change just that one thing that I said or did, right? And it's just a matter of time till I do it again. That is not from God. That is not from God. You are not destined for sin. You are destined for the kingdom. It is extremely important that we understand that. Because when we think we are destined for sin, we're waiting for sin. What happens when you wait for sin? You look for sin. You become conscious of sin. You become conscious of all the stuff, of all the dirt, of all the grime, of all the mire, of all the stuff that the evil one uses to accuse. Remember, he is the accuser of the brethren. Jesus Christ is not. He's the one who sets us free. Right? We've got to get this straight. So when we look at this, this whole little condemnation passage that always comes, not always, but much of the time comes with communion, I'm going to break it wide open here. Because there's a context for that passage, starting in verse 27 and ending in 29. You do it this way, you're drinking judgment upon yourself. Here's the context that gets missed. I'm going to start in verse 17. Paul is talking to the church in Corinth, and they had some problems. Kind of reminds me of us. We have our stuff, okay? But here it is. Now, in giving the following instruction, I do not praise you, because you come together not for the better, but for the worst. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you. Sound familiar? And in part, I believe it. For there must, in fact, be divisions among you, so that those of you who are approved may be evident. What he's saying here is, you guys got problems. You know how I know there's problems? Because you're fighting. Okay? Which, in a way, he's saying, is a good thing, because some of you do have some things figured out, and you're calling these people, you are examining them, you are judging them based on their shortcomings, and now we have a church that's all in disarray and it's a mess, and you're judging each other and you're fighting, and you're quarreling. He says, I, I totally believe that. Okay, so first place, they're arguing, they're fighting, they're quarreling. Now when you come together at the same place, which was their, their custom, you're not really eating the Lord's Supper for when it is time to eat, everyone proceeds with his own supper. One is hungry and another becomes drunk at church. Do you not have houses so that you can eat and drink? Or are you trying to show contempt for the church of God by shaming those who have nothing? What should I say to you? Should I praise you? I will not praise you for this. You got people showing up to church. They're cutting to the front of the bread line, to the front of the buffet. They're loading up their plate, literally. They're pounding wine while there's the people in the back saying, oh, no, you guys go ahead. Oh, no, you guys go ahead. They're hungry. And all of a sudden, they're quarreling. There's fighting. Everybody is selfish. And he's saying, this isn't the Lord's Supper. You guys aren't celebrating anything. You guys have it completely backwards. That is the context for if you do it this way, you are drinking judgment on yourself. Whew. Do you see that? Can I get an amen? amen. That, yeah, amen. That's the context for what we're talking about. So when it gets taken out of that context and says all of a sudden when you take communion, the focus is on you, that completely ruins the pattern that Christ Jesus set up. Do you see that? That's very interesting. If we want to take a context that puts condemnation back onto God's people, which Jesus died to take off, 
but we're going to celebrate what we took, he took off by being guilty again, it makes my head hurt. That's contrary to the gospel and the nature of Christ Jesus, which is indeed redemption, communion. Remember, covenant, we are in the new covenant. Covenant is the pattern of how things will be in the future. Not all the junk you messed up back there. The covenant says, here's the plan. Like when Betsy and I were married, we say, here's the deal. I'm going to forsake all other people. I'm going to walk with you till death do us part, sick or poor, all of that. We are together. These are the ground rules for our relationship moving forward, and I will love you, and I will do my best to take care of you. That's what Jesus said. But yet we're saying, no, 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 but I got to go back here, Lord, because I need to feel guilty. I'm condemned. And he says, no, no, I died so that you wouldn't be condemned. It doesn't matter how you feel. The fact is the kingdom of God has come, is among you. You are forgiven. When you repented of your sins, when you gave your heart to God and said, I have sinned, and you say, please forgive me. And he says, absolutely. I will fill you with my spirit. Here's what our future looks like together. And we go backwards. We're completely messing everything up. And I'm not saying you're doing away with your salvation, but what we're doing is we are, again, hamstringing ourselves. You will live a life ineffective, living a life out of the kingdom. Your spiritual gifts aren't going to show up. You're not even going to try because you're just going to be like, again, I am a loser and I messed this thing up again and I'm just going to... Maybe if I hear a good sermon in the future, maybe if I watch a good movie and I feel inspired enough, maybe then I could turn my life around, right? I've done that. I don't know about you guys, but I remember going to church and being like, come on, God, just give me a good sermon so that I could have a good week because I'm tired of feeling guilty all the time, right? When that was completely contrary to the gospel. That's not how we're supposed to live. So if I could get our uh, servers to come forward. Did we get servers? If not, we could just do it right. Oh, okay, cool. All right, if we could get you guys to come up. And I do want to remind everybody for communion, we do have the benevolence offering, um, and we do have gluten-free bread, which is awesome, because I used to always have to give my poor daughter like little chunks of gum or <laughs> uh, breath mints or something for communion. So, um, and then we're going to go to our offering after this. But... What I really believe God is doing in this church, um, I know that there is a huge prayer initiative. There are um, so many things going on in this church, but one of the things that God is doing is he is calling his people to judge rightly. Because, as we've said, how is one of the best ways to push somebody away from the church? To judge them, to be a hypocrite, to be a judge, okay? What God is calling us to be is a place where the truth is the truth, where there is a difference in the people here, to where we know what love is, we know how to love, and love is discernment, love is giving the truth to people, genuinely being ourselves. And it has also occurred to me that there are people here today and listening that you feel condemned. You've felt this condemnation for a while now. And Christ Jesus died to set you free from it. Christ Jesus died to set you free from it. You need to get that today. And we're going to celebrate this with communion. This isn't about you looking at your stuff. This is about looking at what he did about it. That he set you free from it. And that is what we celebrate. We examine the purity of our hearts as we look to our king. That's what we are examining, not the junk. How good is he? So I want to pray real quick, but the logistics... If you'd come down the side aisles and exit the front, we'll partake together. Lord God, we worship you. Thank you for what you have done. We could never thank you enough that you indeed set us free from the guilt, the shame, the condemnation. That no matter what we're thinking or feeling, the fact is your kingdom has come and you said it is finished. 
You are forgiven. Now go and sin no more. Live the life that I called you to live. Thank you that you said in your word that if any of you does sin, there is one contending on your behalf before the throne of the Almighty God. Thank you that if we sin, we're not catching you off guard and here comes the cycle, God, of beating ourselves up. Thank you that you have that all figured out too. You are wonderful. You are marvelous. You are so good. It's, it's, it's unfathomable. It's so difficult to understand your goodness that you set us free from past, present, and future sins. That we are not judged. And now we can go about a life being discerning, knowing what is right, and stepping into the kingdom and living the lives that you have called us to give or to live. Thank you that this is real, that this is true. You are good, Lord. We worship you and we thank you for this communion that we have with you. The covenant, the deal between you and us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. He is enough. He is enough. Praise his name. He is enough. And may you, when that accuser of the brethren and our sisters, when he comes to condemn, may your eyes be fixed on Jesus Christ, the one who paid the price so that you can live in freedom and you can say yes and amen to Jesus, what he has done. He is enough. May you be overwhelmed by his power and his sufficiency in his life, death, and resurrection. As you go this week, when it happens, give glory and praise to him. Be blessed in the name of Jesus Christ, the King. Amen.